Coming up on Mayo Clinic Q&A. When a liver cancer is diagnosed, alcohol is often blamed for the disease. But in most cases, it's from other factors. The ones that place patients at highest risk of developing liver cancer, not related to alcohol, that actually results from an accumulation of fat in the liver, and it tends to be associated with obesity and diabetes. As with all cancers, early diagnosis is key for treatment. So the treatment options vary depending upon what stage of the liver cancer patient has. The small or early stage tumors in patients who have good liver function and who are otherwise healthy may be treated with surgery. They may also be treated with ablation procedures. These treatments are not an option, uh, but the cancer is still relatively early stage, then liver transplantation is another option. Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. While still relatively rare, the rate of primary liver cancer has been increasing in recent decades, and it disproportionately affects those of minority populations. The National Cancer Institute estimates there will be more than 42,000 new cases of liver cancer this year. So how is liver cancer diagnosed and treated? Well, we have just the expert to discuss this with us today. Here to discuss is Mayo Clinic gastroenterologist, Dr. Sumera Ilyas. Welcome. Thanks for being here, Samara. Thank you so much, Dr. Gazalka, for uh, having me with you today. It's my pleasure to be here. So I think one of the most confusing things, and I'm wondering if you can straighten this out right at the beginning, is liver cancer. Is it cancer that happened in the liver itself, or is it can cancer that came from somewhere else and spread into the liver? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, when we when what we refer to as primary liver cancer. So that's cancer that arises in the liver. And there are two main types of primary liver cancer. There's hepatocellular carcinoma um, that we refer to as HCC, and there's bile duct cancer. Uh, the vast ma of these, uh, the vast majority of primary liver cancers are hepatocellular carcinoma, it's over 90%. Um, having mm -hmm. said that, uh, most, um, actually up to 50% of, uh, of um, uh, masses that are diagnosed in the liver may actually be from a cancer that arose outside the liver. So that would be metastatic cancer. I think that's confusing because sometimes patients will say, I have liver cancer, but actually they had another type of cancer and it spread. So we're right. talking today about primary liver cancers. Um, can you tell us who's at risk? What causes liver cancer? The, the vast majority of liver cancers, over 90%, they occur in patients who have a chronic liver disease. Uh, cirrhosis or advanced scarring of the liver um, is the strongest risk factor for hepatocellular carcinoma. And cirrhosis from really any cause uh, um, can, can, can lead to liver cancer. When I think about cirrhosis, I think about alcohol, but that's not the only cause. Right. So th there are a number of um, liver diseases that can result in cirrhosis. Um, the ones that place patients at highest risk of developing liver cancer include non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or NASH. And that actually results from, that's not related to alcohol, that actually results from an accumulation of fat in the liver. And it tends to be associated with obesity, um, what we refer to as metabolic syndrome and, um, and, uh, and diabetes. And in the Western world, this is becoming the fastest growing cause of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma or liver cancer. Uh, alcohol consumption is an important risk factor, and that can also cause cirrhosis and lead to, to liver cancer. Um, but I would say that worldwide, the most common cause of, uh, 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 of liver cancer remains infection with hepatitis B, and that, mm -hmm. that accounts for approximately 50% of all uh, cases of liver cancer worldwide, but only about 20% uh, um, in the Western world. And that's because we're often vaccinated? Yes, exactly. That, and that's one of the ways uh, that, that, that we can try to prevent having chronic liver disease or cirrhosis and uh, um, lessen the chance of having liver cancer. Can I step back and ask you to define what does cirrhosis mean? Does it mean the liver cells are dying or they're not working as well as they should? What does that term mean? Yeah, so cirrhosis, what that means is over time, um, so NASH, NASH is there's inflammation in the liver. And over time, that inflammation can lead to scarring of the liver. A scarred mm -hmm. liver becomes sort of very hard and, and, uh, um, and then, and, and it does not function um, as well as it normally would. And it can lead to a lot of the problems that we see in patients who have um, end-stage liver disease. 
getting back to a primary liver cancer, why are minority populations disproportionately affected? Yeah, so that's a very important question. And there's a great deal of interest and in research in trying to figure out why this is so. Uh, there's recent work that has shown that Blacks and Hispanics are less likely to be diagnosed with liver cancer at an earlier stage compared to whites. And, and that in turn means the odds of, of being eligible for uh, potentially uh, curative treatments are lower for these patients. And these differences in diagnosis, they may be due to differences in access to primary or sub specialty healthcare. They may also be due to differences in HCC surveillance. Uh, um, so, so what's HCC surveillance? Uh, um, for patients who have cirrhosis, we recommend that they have uh, surveillance for hepatocellular carcinoma every six months. That okay. usually involves having an ultrasound or a blood test. Uh, sometimes there may be a CT scan or an MRI. And Blacks and Hispanics are, are less likely to have the surveillance, which means they're less likely to, to have their liver cancer picked up earlier. Um, when they are uh, diagnosed with liver cancer, they're also less likely to receive HCC treatments. So there are a number of factors that that uh, that um, can be that may be responsible for this, and that includes social de uh, socio demographic in inequalities. Um, there are studies that have shown that patients at safety net hospitals, uh, which we know care for a disproportionate share of uh, racial and ethnic minorities, patients at these hospitals are less likely to get HCC uh, liver cancer treatment, uh, even when they're diagnosed at an early stage. So we certainly need to understand why this is so, because that will allow us to put into place appropriate interventions to, to address these inequities. So Mara, when we're talking about various illnesses, we talk about a lot about signs, which are things that you or I as physicians could observe, and symptoms, which are things that patients feel. What are the signs and symptoms of liver cancer? So in the early stages of liver cancer, patients actually may not have any symptoms. Um, when they do develop symptoms, these symptoms can be very nonspecific. They could be vague. So they may have abdominal pain, and that abdominal pain may be in the, in the right upper side of the abdomen. It may be in the mid-abdomen. They may have noticed that they have a poor appetite um, or they're losing weight without trying to lose weight. And uh, they may have other nonspecific symptoms, feeling weak, feeling fatigued. Um, they may also have symptoms that are specific to liver disease or, or uh, uh, having chronic liver disease. Um, and, and those could be things like having swelling of the abdomen because when, when the liver is really sick, um, the abdomen can fill up with fluid. So the patients, one of the first things they may notice is, well, my belly's gotten very big, um, but it's not, uh, it's not that I've put on weight. Um, they may have jaundice or yellowing of the eyes. So, so it really depends. There's not a specific symptom that could be a tip off to um, the presence of liver cancer, unfortunately. How is the diagnosis made? So hepatocellular carcinoma, it's, it's diagnosed with a combination of blood tests and imaging studies. Um, and the appearance of hepatocellular carcinoma on CT or M MRI, it's so classic that we often don't need a bi liver biopsy or biopsy of the tumor itself. Yeah. And, and so that, that's a little unique about liver cancer compared to some of the other cancers that usually require a biopsy. Um, but there are times that, that the picture, uh, that the pictures, you know, CT or MRI, they aren't as, as typical and, and patients may need a biopsy to confirm the diagnosis of liver cancer. Then how do you treat them after diagnosed? That depends on the stage of the disease. So the treatment options vary um, depending upon uh, what stage of uh, uh, the, uh, the liver cancer patient has. So small or early stage tumors uh, um, in patients who have good liver function and who are otherwise healthy may be treated with surgery. They may also be treated with ablation procedures uh, um, such as microwave ablation or radiofrequency ablation, which essentially use um, heat or or sometimes cold to kill the cancer cells. Uh, if these treatments are not an option, uh, but the cancer is still relatively early stage, then liver transplantation is another option. So this involves taking out the old liver, replacing it with a, a liver from a donor. And it's something that we do uh, quite commonly here at the Mayo Clinic. What other innovative treatments are there for liver cancer? So, so there's, there are um, quite a few innovative uh, treatments. I think there's an interest in learning more about 
uh, proton ther uh, beam therapy. So there, that's radiation therapy um, that's directed towards a tumor and tends to cause uh, less damage to the to the healthy liver. So we're we're, we'll, we're still trying to understand where where that falls in in the treatment of uh, um, of liver cancer. Uh, immunotherapies are being actively studied. So these are drugs that that help the immune system fight uh, um, fight cancer. And, and so there are a number of, of uh, trials that are going on uh, to see if these uh, treatments uh, um, uh, could be can be routine uh, treatments for for patients with liver cancer. So Mira, I bet you're going to tell me that it depends on the stage, but what are the survival rates like for liver cancer? Yeah, so the survival rates, they do vary depending upon the um, stage of the disease. So if we assume that a patient will not get any treatment and they have advanced liver cancer, then the survival rate is expected to be six months or less. Um, for a patient who has uh, a early stage cancer and doesn't receive any treatment, the survival rate can be up to about 36 months. When, when a patient is diagnosed with liver cancer, I mean, 42,000 cases, that sounds bad, but if you compare it to some of the other types of cancer that are diagnosed in the United States, it's not as many cases. And so I'm imagining that it is important to go to a center or to find uh, an, um, a gastroenterologist or an oncologist who's familiar with uh, this disease. Absolutely. I think that's re that's very, very important because a lot of these treatments, you know, and I, again, I emphasize that the treatments depend on the stage of the disease, but a lot of these treatments require expertise. Um, and so, you know, whether that's a microwave ablation or radio frequency ablation, you need an experienced radiologist. Uh, we have other local regional uh, treatments such as um, chemoembolization or radioembolization that involve taking a catheter and placing it uh, into the blood vessels to deliver radioactive beads or, or chemotherapy drugs or block off to, uh, flow, uh, blood flow to the tumor. And, and so you really, uh, patients really need to be at a center that has done, that has a, um, where, uh, where the um, interventionalists have a lot of experience uh, with these procedures to have the best chance uh, um, of uh, a successful uh, intervention and good outcomes. So how would a patient know whether they were coming to the right place to receive care or what questions could they ask? Yeah, so I think some of the questions they can ask is, you know, they can ask their provider, what, what is the stage of my cancer? And so what are my treatment options for this stage? And, and what, what do you have available here? What is your experience with this? What are your outcomes? I think these are all very fair questions that patients have every right to, to ask their providers and get good answers to. Um, I think that the other things that, that patients can think about, especially if they have advanced disease or disease that may have spread outside the liver um, and, 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 and first line treatment uh, with, uh, with systemic therapy maybe didn't work as well, it's important to get a biopsy of the tumor so it can be sent for uh, specialized testing that we call next generation sequencing. Um, and that essentially looks for mutations that can help the tumor grow. Um, and and for, for, for us physicians, it helps, uh, it can potentially help uh, um, identify drugs that, that may work against those mutations and, uh, um, and may be more appropriate for a certain patient depending upon their sequencing results. So Mary, you already talked about this a little bit, but um, what other research is going on in the world of liver cancer? So there's actually a, a great deal of exciting research that's going on uh, from investigating how to prevent liver cancer. And much of that research is focused on treatments of, of actually the causes of liver cancer or cirrhosis. Uh, there's also a great deal of research looking at ways to detect liver cancer earlier, uh, because earlier de detection means having a better chance of a uh, cure. So investigators, researchers are working on developing tests such as biomarkers that can um, help us diagnose the cancer at an earlier stage. And of course, there's a lot of effort directed towards a better treatment of uh, liver cancer. There are numerous ongoing clinical trials that are looking at combinations of chemotherapies and immunotherapies and, and also looking at those combinations in different stages of disease, right? So for example, in the earlier stage of disease, 
can we combine chemotherapy and immunotherapy with surgery uh, to have a better chance of, uh, of having a cure after surgery? And, uh, and in the later stages, it, can we find the right combinations that help uh, uh, prolong survival for patients compared to what we currently have available? So I would say there's a great deal on the horizon and we eagerly await the, the results of these, um, of these studies to, to see how we can improve the lives of, um, of our wonderful patients. So Mara, earlier you mentioned hepatitis B vaccines, and I'm wondering, are there other things that individuals can do to help prevent liver cancer? No, I, I would say that one of the things that one other things that patients can do um, is uh, in terms of prevention. How do we prevent liver cancer? Well, the yes. best way of preventing it is is by trying to prevent uh, uh, liver uh, liver disease from happening. Um, so I, I, I mentioned earlier hepatitis B. Um, getting a vaccination against hepatitis B, and then having a healthy life, uh, uh, lifestyle um, with uh, um, a healthy diet and exercise to maintain a healthy weight. And then if, if a patient does drink alcohol, I would say that to, to limit that, that consumption. I think these are, these are important things that patients can try to do um, to, to prevent uh, uh, getting liver disease, which again, is the biggest risk factor for liver cancer. And they seem very consistent with um, other diseases when individuals come to speak here. Those are those are common healthy lifestyle tips. So very helpful. Thank you. Which is a good thing, right? <laughs> That's right. Thank you for being here today, Samara. Of course. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Our thanks to Mayo Clinic gastroenterologist Dr. Samara Ilias for being here today to talk to us about liver cancer. I hope that you learned something. I know that I did. We wish each of you a wonderful day. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.